Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Before I start today, I want to give a shout out to my long-term sponsors, Blue Chew. Blue Chew is the online service that delivers pills in the form of a chewable tablet with the same ingredients as Viagra or Cialis. So if you feel like you're struggling a little bit to perform in bed, you should definitely give Blue Chew a try. Go to bluechew.com and use code Holly to get your first shipment for free. Just pay $5 in shipping. All right, so let's get to our guest today. She is definitely somebody that um, I actually wanted, we were just talking about how before when she was shooting, before like both of us kind of took a hiatus, I'd always wanted to shoot her. So I got the next best thing, which is her sitting clothed in front of me (laughs) (laughs) and being able to actually have a conversation with her. She loves the finer things in life and is definitely not afraid to set high standards for everything else around her. She first got into the industry more than a decade ago, and after a five-year hiatus, she is back and more beautiful than ever. Welcome, Chloe Amor. Hi, thank you so much. I'm super excited to be here. I'm a little nervous, but I'm very excited. Okay. And yes, I was like happy to hear that you did want to shoot me when I was very active, but I'm even happier that I'm finally on your podcast. Yeah. I mean, now I get to know you in a different way, right? Yes. I get to like um, explore your brain rather than Explore Your Body is not the right way to say it (laughs) because I'm not a performer and I would not touch her in any kind of appropriate way, but Mm. with my lens, perhaps, is what we'll say. Trading, admiring my body to Admiring your mind. Yes, (laughs) exactly. I mean, I always admire both, Mm. you know. (laughs) I mean, and I do say that the best part about my job is working with the people that I work with, not just because they're beautiful people, but because I find you know, porn stars in general just to be the most like entertaining, Mm -hmm. interesting, like funniest, most creative, most innovative people, honestly. So we're very open minded. Yes. Yes. At least we we try. Yes. Very, very much so. All right. So let's start from the beginning. Um, Chloe, how did you get into the industry in the first place? Okay. I get asked this question a lot. Um, I was recruited by my first agency, which is Motley Models. Uh, Since I've been back, I don't think they exist anymore. They sure don't. (laughs) Somebody Um, got caught filming girls without their knowledge in the back room. Yeah. Shouldn't do that. And definitely shouldn't store it in a Dropbox and then accidentally send the link to said model. Thankfully, I didn't have (laughs) that particular experience. But um, yeah, they recruited me through Model Mayhem, which used to be like this huge, like, you know, community. um. You know what's so crazy is I guess it still exists, (laughs) Model Mayhem. It still exists. I think I still get emails, but I just, I have like 20 email (laughs) accounts. I can't check them all all the time. I haven't been on there in a long time. Actually, I remember they, I got in a fight with them over something and now I can't remember what it was. Well, you're not allowed to talk about porn on Model Mayhem. So right. the recruitment, which that agent is not with him anymore. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know when um, he stopped working with them, but he was very aggressive and he was very good about like recruiting beautiful young models. And so um, he would send me like examples of models he was representing and how he got them into like penthouse and hustler and just kind of like showing like, hey, like you can work for these companies and do like glamorous nudes. And then he would slowly add things of like what my job would entail. So mm-hmm. it's like, oh, okay, you're going to do nudes, but then you're also going to do like teases and like spreads and then, hey, are you open it? So he got my email and then that's when he kind of like started to express about, you started know, to push booking it more. me for porn. Yeah. Because yeah, on Model Mayhem, they would have yeah. banned him. I think what it was is I was shooting for something for Playboy mm-hmm. and they flagged me for that. And I was like, it's Playboy. Are you fucking kidding? I can't remember That was, was actually the first company I ever did a professional photo shoot. And that is actually the reason why they had contacted me was because those were like the only professional uh, photos that I had. So I wasn't like putting straight up nudes on um, Model Mayhem, but there was the Playboy Plus like symbol. And I was under a different name too. I had changed my name when I got into porn. I didn't use the Playboy name. So that was where I think he thought, oh, she's going to be open to this and let me throw out 
big company names, you know, to lure her in, which I wouldn't change a thing. I mean, I <laughs> I did it. I committed to it. I'm back. And so that's just kind of like a brief yeah. explanation. Yeah. Because he was like, okay, are you open to doing solos? And I'm like, okay. Because Playboy Live was a thing mm-hmm. back then, which that. was like a webcamming site. Yeah. So. You weren't doing solos on there, but you were teasing. So, and I was a very like sexual, free spirited person at the time. I was like early 20s. So, um, I was like, okay, yeah, that's fine. And then he was like, are you open to doing girl, girl? And I was thinking, like, well, I've shot with other models nude. We didn't do anything sexual, but I was just very sexually curious and like, you know, would make out with girls and, you know, get horny and stuff. So I was like, okay, I'm open to that. And then he (laughs) added another thing, like, are you open to doing boy girl? I had a boyfriend at the time, a very serious relationship that I was in. And when I was, you know, talking to him about like, hey, like this agent wants to recruit me to do this. Like he said, he can book me three months solid, like Arizona, Florida, California. Um, He was like, no, I don't want you like sleeping with other guys. And then the agent came back and said, well, it's the most in demand. So you'll get the most work. And I am predominantly like straight. Like I do like girls brunettes especially <laughs> but um <laughs> <Damn>. i wouldn't <laughs> like marry a girl so i yeah we're a pain in the ass <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm okay with um obviously having sex with guys mm-hmm. so i got talked into it and my boyfriend just accepted it because he's like i want to be with you I, that's a whole nother story wow i mean a, a year was- after me being in the industry we broke up it became very toxic yeah i can imagine i mean a lot of guys have a hard time with that did he i mean looking back on it now do you think that he just like didn't understand what he was getting into or do you think that he was just trying to hold on to you no matter what i think he was just trying to hold on to me no matter what i think they never really know what they're getting into i think even if you try to date somebody in the industry once you start having emotions and feelings like a lot of us are very territorial and, um, you know, it's human nature to kind of feel that like jealousy and control. I admire couples where they don't allow that to interfere with their relationships because even for myself, it is hard for me to want to share the mm. person that I'm in love with or mm-hmm. very attracted to because I want them all to myself. Yeah. Um, but it became very toxic because he started to watch my scenes and he would make comments like, why are you doing things with this person? that you don't do at home with me why do you look at them like that there was one scene where we had to take i had to take selfies with male talent for the scene and i had he give he gave me a ride um because i had just moved to california and i didn't have a car yet in california so he gave me a ride from set because we both lived in woodland hills at Mm -hmm. the time um i left my shoes in his car and so my ex who was my boyfriend at the time freaked out why like because he had to come back and drop off my shoes so like Mm -hmm. why are your shoes in his car like why is there pictures of y'all on your phone like thinking that we were doing something like outside of the shoot so it just was like volatile where he wanted to just like break into my phone and like throwing shit and it's crazy because till this day um he still tries to be my friend like we're cordial and I think that if I wanted to get back with him which there's quite a few exes that want to try to get back to me who have given me issues about the whole porn um Mm -hmm. career it was just toxic I mean once I'm done I'm done like I'm a Gemini like I'm just like I will love you forever until you give me reasons not to and then my I'm just super guarded like I just can't change I mean I changed Every second, every minute, every month, every week, every year. Like, I just, Mm -hmm. I'm not the same person, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think they kind of realize, like, I blew it. Like, because especially when my career starts to get more successful and and if they watch porn, they're seeing me everywhere. They're constantly reminded of me that they used to be with me and could have probably married me. And remind you, he was like 10 years older than me. So, Mm. uh, you know, I was 22, dating somebody that was much older. You know, he had probably more control over me at the time. 
Yeah, I was able to just like break free from that relationship. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, having like been in the industry for a while, having gone through all of that, have you been able to have a relationship with somebody where the guy could fully accept that you were working an adult? Or do you think, think that's just not, that hasn't worked for you? There's been a couple of times. There's also been a lot of like outside interference with my serious relationships. Um, one of them, which there was a guy who I was dating who was from Canada. Um, he treated me very well. He didn't care about the porn stuff at all, but he lied to his family about what I did. And mm. so I couldn't be with somebody that couldn't be honest with their own family. Like, I'm not going to live a lie. Yeah. You know, um, another time was somebody who I was with the longest. We were together off and on for six years. In the beginning, his friends would get in his head about it. Like, yeah, oh, why is it's Chloe always the friends. allowed to yeah. like hook up with all these guys and you can't like hook up with other girls? Because they missed having their friend around them like as a bachelor to go out mm -hmm. and have like guys night and stuff. And mm -hmm. when we started dating, we were pretty much inseparable. And it wasn't like I was telling him, you can't go out with your friends. It's just he chose to spend time with me and he real because we spent so much time together like he realized like what it was like he knows like he's the lucky one because he's the one that I'm coming home to um and then there was a third relationship because this is over the course of 10 years yeah <laughs> then there was a third relationship where like yeah he didn't care at all he was not the jealous type at all the reason why that ended was because he is a very needy person and he mm. also had an ex-wife with two kids the his children were closer to my age and um i just <sighs> wasn't ready to kind of take that on as a stepmom although yeah. i'm categorized as that now which is hilarious <laughs> but um yeah so there was at least three different relationships where they were okay with and then there was Ugh, there's a bunch where they weren't. <laughs> yeah. Was yeah. this your was this guy your sugar daddy? Because you just sugar yeah, daddy, that right? Was the most and then he ended up one. becoming a relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that was when I was on break. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um that was part of how I was able to take a break for so long. Right. And he never made me feel like I had to quit doing porn. He just knew that there was a reason why I wanted to take a break. Mm -hmm. And he just made me feel like you can take this break as long long as you want and I will take care of you. You know, it's such a long story with it because he had gotten relocated to Asia because of his job. Mm -hmm. And then we had the whole COVID pandemic. So right. I just felt like we both felt like it's hard to do long distance. Yeah. But then in the most recent years, about 2021 and 2023, um, we had started our relationship back again because then he moved to Costa Rica, but we would travel to Vegas and Miami a lot together mm -hmm. and sometimes Beverly Hills. But, um, you know, I think what had happened was there was so many things that I was open to and ready for in the beginning of our relationship, which was in 2019. And then as years passed, I was growing and learning more about myself. And then I just kind of got scared and felt like I didn't want to take on all of the things that he came with, which is, you know, integrating myself into his family. Yeah, that's scary. Because that's forever. I I'm, dated a guy with two kids. Two kids. And, yeah. yeah. I'm a child of divorce. So I know what it's like for my dad to be bringing around young women and my dad's second wife I think I knew her for like two weeks and then found out that they were getting married and that she was pregnant and so I think that triggered me yeah, because I was sense. like oh my god am I doing that yeah you know so yeah. I just had to cut ties but we're friends I am still friends with quite a bit of my exes who I've had serious relationships with I would say he's probably the one that I like probably the only one that I would reconsider getting back with okay. just because he's just so like non-judgmental and he just hard worships me. Yeah. <laughs> I think it kind of worships me a little too much, but um, yeah. It's hard to find that balance. Like I ended up meeting my husband when I was like, I was trying to remember, we've been together like eight years and I'm 45. So that's what, 30, 
Seven. Yeah. I work important because I'm not good at math, people. All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah. And, you know, I had had a, uh, been married before okay. and my ex husband was very needy. And that was like, that did not work for me at all. And everybody's different, right? Like they had their different needs. And yeah. I needed somebody who's really independent and yeah. who wasn't like super emotionally needy and who was stable mm-hmm. and who was mm-hmm. solid and, mm-hmm. and all of these things. And yeah, I, I got lucky. But before him, like, I was perpetually single most of the time because I, I could not stay in relationships. Like I always would bounce after six months or a year just because I got bored of them or they got mm. too needy or mm. I just yeah. couldn't stay. Yeah. And I actually thought there was something wrong with me because I was like, maybe I'm just like not able to love somebody. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I seriously thought it was me. And then I met the right person. I was like, oh, they just weren't the right person. Right. You know? Right. right. So it, it can take a while. It's definitely taking a minute for me. Yeah, I'm a hopeless romantic, and I want to just have that spark with somebody. Yeah. Um. Sometimes I think I self sabotage my relationships because of my own habits, like mm-hmm. wanting that control. I do actually need a lot of attention, mm-hmm. <laughs> but not too much attention. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because during that break, I was like. I was like his everything. Like Mm -hmm. if he said jump on a plane tomorrow, I'm like, okay, I'm going, you know? So um, I'm just used to, I guess, always having somebody there who wants to pay attention to me, wants to text me every day, good morning, good night, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. You know, who like actually cares. If I don't get that type of attention, I start to feel weird. I start to feel triggered, especially when I'm being flooded all day by fans telling me how amazing I am. It's it's like, I love that and I'm grateful for that. But then sometimes I feel like something's wrong with me. Like, why is that not enough for me? Like. Why is it that I'm allowed to be the busy one, but then if somebody else is too busy for me, I like freak out? Yeah. And then that's when I self-sabotage. Yeah. And then especially if they start to give me a hard time about my career, then that I definitely start to like push them away. And yeah. Then, yeah. Well, it sounds like you're aware of the <laughs> issues and that's the first step, right? Is to like yeah. being aware of it and then just figuring out how to like, mm-hmm. like you know, you said, manage- find the balance. Yeah. yeah. And also like manage your, you know, like I think one of the things that I, I love how this turned into a dating show. Um, <laughs> but like one of the things that I had to learn that I think has been super helpful for me in my marriage is managing expectations. I truly believe that managing expectations is like the key to happiness. Mm-hmm. And I think that a lot of times we have unreasonable expectations that we put on people yeah. because there's something inside of us that needs like some void that we need to fill. Mm-hmm. Um, and so once I, and when I say managing expectations, I don't mean that like my husband doesn't like meet expectation. You know what I mean? Like it sounds almost like, yeah, well, he's all right. And I'm okay with that, but it's not, it's not that. <laughs> yeah. It's just like everybody's got certain things that is really great about them and other things that maybe doesn't fulfill that, that need that you need or something like that, if that makes sense. Like people are not perfect is what I'm saying. Right. And I think that the problem with a lot of monogamous relationships, and I am monogamous and that's what works for me. I'm is, monogamous also. Yeah. If you find that hard to believe, but yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. and some people are, are, I know a lot of polyamorous people and, and it's always interesting for me to talk to them because I feel like maybe this issue doesn't come up for them as much as it does for some of us people who are in monogamous relationships. But like we expect our partner to like fulfill all of these things that we need, like our physical needs, our emotional needs, like our security needs, Mm. um, our entertainment needs, like whatever. Right. Mm. And like one person generally cannot hit all of those marks. And so I think once we get to a place where we realize that we need other people in our life that maybe help us fulfill certain things that we can't necessarily get all of that from our partner. You know, it's like this Disney princess idea that we grew up with. Like, we're going to find this man. He's going to be perfect in every single way. And he's always going to be the same. And he's never going to like deviate from like, you know, this like being, you know, this, this certain kind of guy. And I think it's an unreasonable thing to ask for people. And so I think like if we can recognize that, you know, relationships have their ebb and flow and people have their ebbs and flows and, you know, like decide what's important to you, right? And what's not important to you. And like, yeah, yeah, it's really hard for me because if we you were talking about like security needs too. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think because I'm a child of divorce and I saw a lot of what my mom went through, that I have major like 
security needs. Yeah. Um, Did your mom struggle being a single mom? You know, she works all the time. And I was an only child till I was 10. So my dad didn't remarry until I was 10. But um, and then my mom never she, my mom didn't remarry until I was 15. So it's like there's all these years where she was just, you know, never home. And then she also like started drinking a lot. So did my dad when they got divorced. So if she wasn't working, she was partying. And I just, I felt like I was developing a lot of resentments like towards my dad and even my mom, you know, like I just felt like I don't want to struggle. Like I'm mm -hmm. not going to be with a man who's just going to leave me with a mm -hmm. kid and fill my head with like all this fantasy. Like, so even though I went through that, like my mom did teach me a lot about like independence and hard work. And I feel like if I'm busting my ass and like sacrificing a lot, especially the sacrifices that I make being on the internet and, you know, um, I need somebody who's going to be strong enough to be able to hold their own. If there's any traditional values that I believe in, it is where the woman or wife is the nurturer and the man, the husband is the provider. And I don't need you to rub it in my face of how much I make or how much income I bring because I need you to step up and provide for the family. Cause then it's like, like, okay, I'm going to like a lot of the times, like we get left with that role to take care of the child. And I feel like a lot of the times people don't give us as much credit for that, mm -hmm. you know, um, because that is a full-time job in mm -hmm. itself. So <laughs> it's like to have to add on like, yes, take care of the household and work. And it's like, oh, okay. And then the man just works. Like, um, I'm okay. Then I need you to help with all these expenses that we have because we're trying to build a family. Cause one day I want that. And so the beginning of my relationships, like I kind of feel people out and see like how they treat me. And it, it's frustrating because sometimes I think that they confuse that with um, thinking that I'm being superficial or materialistic, especially if they know that I've had like sugar daddies in the past, which that's not the case at all. I just need to know that you can stand your own and be independent and not have to rely on me for everything and not manipulate me thinking that I'm relying on you for everything yeah. when I'm still working yeah. and still willing to like bear children and yeah. still willing to like keep a household together and then manage all the shit that you don't want to manage that's at home right yeah. it's like cleaning and cooking or whatever it may be um so it's hard to find both with that and also fulfilling those physical needs because a lot of the times when i date people in serious relationships i don't really go based off like physical attraction mm. if anything that kind of triggers me a little bit where i feel like I can't trust you, you know? You never want to be the um, the <laughs> the ugly one in the relationship. No, wait. Well, no, you no, always, sorry. You I, always want to be the better looking one in the relationship. Yeah. No, I never want to <laughs> date a man prettier than me. Oh, same. Sorry, I agree. Babe. I agree. I agree. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. No, I actually like, I'm totally with you and- yeah, I feel like I thank God he doesn't watch this podcast, but I feel like I have to say, like, my husband's really <laughs> handsome, I swear. Um, I'm very attracted to him. But yeah, Beauty no, from I don't the inside. <laughs> I, I am not about like really good looking guys. Mm -hmm. There the, it is like for me, it's an instant like mm, like it's just I don't know. Like I've never really I dated like one really good looking guy. And you know why we broke up? Because he went on fucking Temptation Island and lied to me oh, about it. Wow. Yeah, I know. With another ex? Well, he so Temptation Island, uh, this is an older reality TV show. I've watched it. Okay, it's so got you like know what I'm five seasons or something. Yeah, yeah. and <laughs> I think there's. It, so it's the couples and then it's the ones that lure, like try to. Yes, the yes. Couples. So we were not the couple. He was one of the single guys, uh, but he wasn't single. We were together. He lied to me and told me he went to Costa Rica on a surf trip. And okay. then he came back and he was like, babe. And he also ended up being like the first guy voted off and everyone hated him on the show and said he was a total douche. And I'm like, you fucking like deserve karma. it. karma. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and I was like, yeah, never again. But um, yeah. I'm like, I'm That's not, crazy. I don't, I don't I, trust real, super good looking guys. I'm sorry. I just don't. I almost did something like that in the really? beginning of my career. Yeah. Um, there was this show, which I think it's still on. It's called Are You the One with MTV. Mm -hmm. But it was super new where it hadn't been released yet. And um, at the time, I was kind of 
not really doing castings, but I would get emails about, hey, we like your look. Like, can you audition for this, that, and whatever? I didn't go because I was in that serious relationship, even though we ended up breaking up, just because I didn't want to be an asshole. Yeah. Um, although I was always like, I want to be on reality TV, yeah. you know? But then I was like, wait, it's a dating show. Yeah. Because it was like a matchmaker kind of thing, and they all have to figure out, like, who's a match. And it's all, like, young people just, like, partying and having fun. So I'm glad that I didn't do that. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> obviously the karma's not good. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I have to say that you sound, like, incredibly self-aware. Like, you obviously, like, know where your needs and your issues come from. Mm -hmm. And that's, like... I think really admirable because a lot of people aren't Thank like you. they're a certain way and they don't know why they don't choose to explore it. You've clearly like spent a lot of time like thinking about this and, and, and being aware of that. And I think that that's sometimes like the best we can do, you know, is just like know what our issues are mm -hmm. and try to, you know, manage our lives the best way that we can with those things kind of our, our luggage, you know, the, our baggage yeah. that we bring, at least we know what our baggage is, you know? Yeah. So yeah. that's, it's important to know what's in your purse. Thank you. I appreciate that. I feel like a lot of guys, even if I try to be transparent with them, it's just like in one ear and out the other. It's yeah. like no convincing yeah. them. Well, so. you know what? I mean, it's saving you a lot of time. They're not the one. They're not the one. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're going to take a quick commercial break. And then when we come back, we're actually going to, we'll probably go back to talking about porn. I don't know. I think this is a porn <laughs> podcast. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, stick around. We'll be right back. Attention ladies, have you ever used the old I have a headache excuse? Well, now it's time to be genuinely in the mood with Slumber's amazing libido boosting gummies. Packed with natural aphrodisiacs like horny goat weed and maca root, these passion fruit flavored gummies will reignite that spark that you've been missing. So whether you're looking to rekindle that fire or turn the heat up even higher, these gummies have got your back. They're low in sugar, caffeine free, and doctor approved. But that's not all. Slumber also offers sleep gummies that are truly life-changing. These little gummies have worked wonders for me. They're perfect for anyone struggling to fall asleep. They'll help you drift into a peaceful slumber and stay asleep with zero grogginess in the morning. So why not add a little balance to your bedtime routine? Get your hands on Slumber's libido and sleep gummies today and make your nights a whole lot more exciting. Use code HOLLY for listeners to receive 25% off at slumbercbn.com. That's S-L-U-M-B-E-R-C-B-N.com. All right, guys, welcome back. So, Chloe, let's rewind a little bit um, and talk about you first getting into the industry. So, you were, you know, kind of being like... <laughs> you know, brought, reeled in a little bit with like, you know, little breadcrumbs of like yeah. solo, girl, girl, boy, girl. Mm. So when you finally made the leap and decided to do porn, like what was your first scene? So there's this like niche company site. It's called FTV Girls. Oh, I know them well. Where you go out and like do public, they're in Arizona. Yeah. You go out and do like public nudity and. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. So first time video, they only hire girls where it's their first time ever doing porn. And it was a little scary for me because I'm like, okay, yeah, like I had some experience like being naked in front of the camera, but that's like on a closed set, mm -hmm. like in a room or studio or house or whatever. So, and with my agency at the time, we weren't always given a lot of information about the shoots we were being sent on. Oh, I know. And when I brought that <laughs> up to your agent once, he told me that he didn't give all of the shoot because I'm very clear. Like we were talking earlier, like I hate surprises. I'm oh, very right. like clear about everything. Mm -hmm. And I like lay out everything that is like expected of that day. And just, I just want to make sure everyone's on the same page and everybody's good. But they, a lot of times wouldn't relay that info to the girl. And so when I confronted the agent about it, he's like, yeah, if you send them all of that, they just like, they get confused and scared off and they won't come. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like the yeah. way that he suggested that, you know, you guys have to be treated like children. Oh yeah. You know, that like yeah. you can't, 
bear the responsibility of a complete call sheet is just insane. I was treated that way in the beginning of my career with my first agency. Yeah, yeah most definitely. Yeah, kind of like, like like they felt like they had to babysit us. And maybe that's true for some girls. It is true for some girls. I will say that. <laughs> it is. But um, yeah, uh, so to go back to with the FTV girls, um. I was able to do the public nudity, you know, it's like sometimes I'd be near a highway where I'd just have to like strip down or we'd be having dinner and then I just have to like flash. Um, it got, when it got to like doing, so it was a shoot booked with like public nudity, you know, nude photo shoot and then some solos and then a boy girl. So it was going to be my first boy girl at the end of the trip. Um, when it came to the solos, like nobody told me that girls were like sticking like foreign objects or like fruits and vegetables I've inside heard this, them. I've heard this too. I've yeah. still never done that to this day. Mm -hmm. Like that does not turn me on. That does not entice me. And it, it's kind of like an awkward feeling because it's like my first shoot. Like I want to do really good and like you're nervous, but like you're still excited, but you're just like, <gasps> Oh my gosh! Like, and he's like, you, here's know, you a want watermelon. Them to like me, yeah. <laughs> and I, here's a core piece of corn. <laughs> it's possible that they might have even asked me like if I wanted to put those things inside my bum too. Like, I it was so long ago, but I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, because we were talking about this how people try to like just throw stuff on you and you're yeah. so upset. Yeah. So I said no, and you know I had never used toys like ever in my life. So just sticking like sex toys in general was like a big deal for me. Mm -hmm. And then for you to like try to get me to put like groceries in there. I mean, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm like a conservative girl from Texas who is <laughs> promiscuous and free spirited. But I mean, it was only like genitalia kind of things or like body parts that I was used to kind of <laughs> getting pleasure from. Um, so that is kind of how it happened. Yeah. And the boy girl, I mean, it's the first time giving a blowjob. And I mean, ever? Yeah. yeah. Ever? Yeah. That mm -hmm. was your first time giving a blowjob? Yes. Was on a, in a porn scene? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How did that go? Did you have any idea what to do? No, I was just, I kind of looked well, at it. Were you just it. like, <sighs> I, I, I think I just kind of had him like, <laughs> like lead me into it. I, I could have just might have like zoned out during that part. Um, Did you like just cover the very piece memorable or like, I don't know. I, I don't even remember wow. it. Yeah. It was just like, cause this is also like somebody who, not, not like I date older men. Like mm -hmm. I prefer to date older men, anyways. But I mean, this was just like okay. I'm 22. This guy's like I don't know. I guess like 20 years older than me, and I've never gotten a blowjob. I'm so used to like having sex with guys that are like closer to my age, and I think the maximum was like 10 years older than me that mm -hmm. I'd ever kind of really hooked up with, and. uh I just, yeah, I just was able to somehow get away with like never giving blowjobs. Yeah, I was literally just thinking like, <laughs> how did you make it to 22 and you never gave a blowjob? They like, just like would eat me out or like, you know, rub it like with some spit. And then I'm like, okay, slide it in. Let's go. You know? Okay. Because I was, I'm like a germaphobe. I know it's weird, but uh, I didn't want to like, like lick where they pee. And uh, my mindset was like. I get it. Penises I mean, aren't really like pretty or anything. So I don't really, <laughs> I would have much went down on a girl. I had gone down on girls. Yeah. Just never on guys yeah. until porn. Yeah. Yeah. And now I'm really good at it. Well, I'm sure. <laughs> if, after so, much practice. Yes. <laughs> lots of practice. Okay. So <laughs> first blowjob and then the sex was like, like, how did the, like, after the scene, how were you feeling? I think I felt like accomplished because that was the last part of that trip. I think mm -hmm. it was like maybe three or four days, mm -hmm. you know, um, for that. Cause there was different shoots. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, I just felt like accomplished. Cause it was like, I had so many scenes booked that I felt like really good about myself. Like, Oh, I'm going to be doing all this work. It's so exciting. Like going to places that I'd never really been. Um, 
you know, meeting new people. So it was just, it, but I felt like I was kind of spoiled because it was a POV thing. So there was literally nobody else but just us. Mm. So in a way, it was a good warm up for me because I had no fucking clue what I was in store for mm -hmm. when I went to Miami. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Miami is wild. That's so that was your next scene? I was my next trip for like a week, literally shooting doubles like two scenes a day. Oof. Yeah. Who were you shooting for there? Oh gosh. Um, the big companies were like Bang Bros, like Mofos, Reality Kings. I was gonna say Reality Kings. Like all of the you know, yeah. all of the I don't know. I mean, I guess they've sold their companies now, but they still have the sites. Um Yeah, Alu owns uh Reality Kings now. Alu or they were Mind Geek. Oh, so that so they got sold again? Uh I don't know. Okay. Well, so yeah, Mind Geek got so they bought by Alu and they changed right? their name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they own Reality Kings, but they're still like running the same. I think they do Mofos too. Yeah. Um, was, uh, but they're still like, it's still like the same site. And all of the little like kind of sub sites or like sister sites of Reality Kings. Like, yeah. I think like, what was it? Like Chongas or something. I don't know. A bunch of Latina stuff too. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 I remember going to Miami though. It did not leave the greatest taste in my mouth because I mm -hmm. felt like. The, the makeup artists there and even the crew, like I felt like they're like, ah, oh, there's these new girls, like we'll see how long they last. Like they didn't really care about how they treated us. And I remember like you, ha you, you have to have the AC off on set and it was so fucking hot. It was yeah, like because in of the May sound. in Miami and I'm just like dripping in sweat and like they barely put any makeup on me and the makeup they put on me, I felt looked terrible. And it was just like, you know, just typical, like, okay. Like, I felt like they, they felt like those makeup artists for RK, like, like made me feel like somebody just pulled me off the street and sat me in the yeah. chair. And the makeup you know? artists are honestly, like, they're a big part of the scene. Like, they're a big confidence booster. They're, like, usually the first person that you connect with on a scene. I'm super picky about my makeup artists, not only because... They have to be good, but they have to have a good attitude and they have to make the girl feel safe and they have to make them feel good. Mm. And they have to like almost like be a therapist. Like yeah. the shit that some of these girls have like like opened up about in the makeup <laughs> chairs is like wild. Yeah. So um I think that that's incredibly important. But there's a lot of conversation around how like the adult industry in Florida is very different than the adult industry, like in California. Yes. That they're like, and that was your experience. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Cause as soon as I started shooting in California, it was totally different. Yeah. It was totally different. And I'm not saying that every set in California is like, she's a princess. It's oh, yeah. just no, like, no, no, no. It's just don't be mistaken. <laughs> it's a different vibe. Yeah. yeah. Um, I had my fair share of bad makeup artists. In, in 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 Florida, in California, in Nevada, like I had yeah. my fair share. Um, I, it took me years for me to finally stand up to myself, and because because if they l make me feel shitty and they make me look shitty, I, how am I supposed to feel confident when I'm doing oh my, my photos? I'm so on board with that. The one thing yeah. that my mother taught me was like, you're only as good as your model feels, mm -hmm. and I think that that's so true. And I think mm -hmm. the makeup artist is such a big part of that. And I remember when I first started branching out for like working for my mom and kind of going independent. I used to work for this uh, director named Jim Malibu okay. who worked for Adam and Eve, who I loved, lovely man, Jim. I know you used to watch my podcasts, such a nice guy, but the makeup artists he used were awful. And yeah. like, he didn't see it. Cause I think maybe like he's a guy. And I just remember this one model coming out of like the makeup and I was supposed to shoot her pictures and they'd like taken, she had straight blonde hair. They'd taken her hair and like, slicked it back but it wasn't like wet right and they like blew dry it looked like she had been in a wind tunnel and it like just like sealed her hair back you know like it looked something about mary kind yes of. <laughs> and her makeup she literally had a line of orange Different like color. right here that was extremely visible and yeah. so i took her into the bathroom and i tried to fix Makes her sense. because i was like girl i can't take pictures of you like that yeah. and there was only like so much i could do i've had bad color matches my hair is naturally dark brown, but I've had artists literally put black on my eyebrows. Mm -hmm. I don't like when they put dark liner inside the waterline. That mm -hmm. makes you look tired. Mm -hmm. If you're going to wear a specific outfit for that, then I'm all for it. But there was just different things. So I had learned to start bringing my own touch-ups. Yeah. And there were some times where like they would come like 
knock on the door when I'm in the bathroom, like, hey, 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 are you ready? And I'm just like, like lying, like, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm using, I'm douching or I'm whatever, douching. like, but I'm really <laughs> fucking trying to fix the makeup. Um, cause you know how you said that Jim might have not noticed the yeah. makeup was A lot bad. Of them, the- they, they think the girl's it. beautiful no matter what. Yeah, they just don't see it. They don't see it. Yeah. Because I've had that where I'm like, oh, I, I, I don't really like it. And they're like, you look great. You don't even need makeup. And I'm like, you're about to shoot me in like high definition where it's yeah. going to show every pore and crevice. Like, what are you talking And it's going to be on the internet forever. Like, what are you talking about? Yeah. So there's some crazy photos of me like yeah. <laughs> on the internet. Yeah, I got to say. I don't good in them. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel for you. Like, I yeah. mean, I was never a model for many reasons, but one of those is like the the lack of control over that. And it's funny because, you know, I do like a little bit of modeling for my OnlyFans now, mm-hmm. but I w- I've always been just a photographer my whole life. Oh, yeah. And now that I'm like, I model sometimes, I, I'm so, it doesn't matter because I'm shooting only for myself. Nobody else gets to shoot me, but like, I'm so fucking picky about my makeup, about the lighting. I like micromanage everything. And it made me realize like I could never be a model because I could never let that shit go. I'd be the biggest pain in the ass. I would be the model that I hate shooting (laughs) because I would just like complain about everything. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the beginning of my career, it was hard because I was very self-critical about yeah. everything. I even developed like body dysmorphia where mm-hmm. I had dropped a lot of weight. And it was crazy because this was before like the whole like big asses trend mm-hmm. like, blew up. So um, I had like, you know, like baby fat, you know, mm-hmm. like just like, like wasn't super lean in my tummy, but like it didn't look bad. And I, I would stare at that because certain poses you would do, like you would see like mm-hmm. rolls and stuff. I would just stare at that. And I had dropped like a double zero because I had six pack, but then like no ass and, and then super picky about the makeup and the hair. But I was taught from my first agency, do not be difficult. You're mm-hmm. not allowed to like say anything or complain. We weren't even allowed to like exchange contacts with people, like mm-hmm. like make friends and like nothing. It was so weird. I trusted them indefinitely mm-hmm. that they had my best interest. And so that was always like instilled in me. So it was like, even when I went with a different agency, I was like, oh no, don't say anything. Don't say anything. If you don't like something, you know, or if it had anything to do with sexual stuff that they were trying to throw on me, I'm immediately like, no, I'm not doing that. Mm -hmm. But if it was like makeup or hair, like if I, I started to, um, I would remember certain artists who would give me (laughs) a hard time where I'm like, okay, I can't say anything to her or else she's going to get all like bitchy about it. But I knew like, thank God I brought my touch ups. Yeah. And then now when I find out if those makeup artists still work on sets that I'm going to be on like now with my agency, I'm like, no. Yeah, I, like uh, they need to either pay me to do my own makeup or they need to hire somebody else. Yeah, or like you know change the call time. Like I don't know. It's just yeah. No, well, you know, like, you're in a position of power where you can do those things. Well, it's like you said, it's like an energy thing too. Like knowing that those people are like nasty. Like yeah, I don't even want you to attempt to do my hair and makeup because your energy is just yes. bad. Yeah, and you don't want to don't need to start off a date. Your, no, yeah, no. So. <laughs> So in an older interview, you said that porn was not like what you expected it to be. How, what were your expectations? Oh gosh. So the only thing that I had really, I had, I think I had only watched porn like two or three times before getting in the industry. Mm -hmm. And it was, I remember the first DVD, it was a guy that I was kind of talking to. My friends and I were like in his room and he had a zero tolerance (laughs) DVD. (laughs) Oh no. And it was Angel Dark, which she follows me on Twitter. Okay. Angel Dark was amazing. So like flattered by that. Yeah, Um, she was incredible. So, you know, she's all like sexy on the staircase and stuff. But then as soon as it went into the sex, it was like, I turned it off. (laughs) So there was that. And then there was another occasion where one of my best friends, their family member, oddly, but through through blood, um, through marriage, um, I guess it was. Pornhub or something, one of those tube sites where some girl's like putting a champagne bottle up her ass and I, or, or a football up her ass. And I'm like, oh my God, turn it off. I a don't want to- football? Wa- yeah, yeah. Or was it a baseball bat? It was a football. It was a football, okay. And Do you remember who it was? Sham- I, some amateur thing. Okay. I was, I think I was a little traumatized. I was like, was well, it like I, a like, like a turn that junior up. Nerf football or was it like a full size like, like standard? Yeah, okay. Big. So it was like a little like 
Yeah, like half like a, of it was like in there. Like a kid's phone. <laughs> And I'm just like, what are what are we watching right now? I was I was not even 21 yet when I yeah. saw that. So those were the only times done. Now, AVN Awards would be broadcasted on Showtime, and mm-hmm. I was like, not allowed to watch that stuff. But I remember seeing um, it was one year where Jesse Jane was hosting, mm. and I was like, oh my god, they're so pretty and they're so glamorous and everything. So when I happened to get into porn, I thought it was going to be super glamorous all the time. So when I was on set, even after the football video. I, I that was like Joe Schmo with a camera. Okay, I get probably. It. it wasn't you said a it was scene. Amateur. It was yeah, like okay. it was like some probably some no name girl. But but how do I know when I'm not watching porn and I don't know right. people's names? Yeah. Um, but I think it kind of like went over my head because I had the FTV girls, which was gentle. And then Miami was just like, it was kind of like party vibes, Mm -hmm. like, you know, just like wilding wilding out. And then with California, it was just more like glamorous. So then in California, when I didn't have more glamorous shoots, that's when I realized like, no, it's some houses are going to be a little grimy. Some crews are not going to give a fuck about you. And you need to bring your own shit, like, if you want to have a smooth shoot. And sometimes people are going to be in a bad mood, and you're just going to have to deal with it. I mean, the industry has changed a lot. And I'm not trying to badmouth anybody or anything, but there were different sets that just had different vibes. And I just learned that it's not going to be – I'm not going to have a makeup artist every time. I'm not going to have a photographer that's going to care every time. Um I'm not going to have a beautiful location to shoot at every time. You're not going to get fed every time. You're not going to get fed every time. Yeah. Some some sets, the cleanliness isn't like, you know, not always going to be there. Yeah. Um. So those were, the, those were the reality checks for me. Like, hey, it's not glamorous all the time. And like, I think that was more where I just thought it was going to be glamorous all the time. Yeah. When it wasn't. No. <laughs> no, it is not. <laughs> or like chill vibes. Unless time. you're on a Holly Randall set, then it's like super glamorous <laughs> and so chill. I'm gonna be treated like a queen. <laughs> we do our best. We do our best. Um, okay, so but then you took a break from porn in 2019 to focus on your mental health. Yes. What happened that made you realize you had to take a step back? So it was at the end of 2018 where I had this like panic attack. I was supposed to fly to New York to do feature dancing and uh, the Sapphire Club. And uh, this was during a time where I was literally five years straight, like saying yes to everything. Mm. And I was a party girl too. So I just like was exhausted. Um, And I was already with Ally Direct at the time. Mm -hmm. And he had me booked for three months of shoots as well, you know? It was yeah, just, he would drive you into the ground. Yeah, like every weekend I was going to have to be traveling to a different state, um, city to do the feature dancing on top of doing shoots. So it was like travel here, travel there, do this, do that, you know? Mm-hmm. I'm not really having like breaks in between. And that's not my agent's fault. Like that's me not giving my time, me time to rest. So I just got extremely overwhelmed because, you know, I was – shooting for companies i would do like webcam shows i would do feature dancing i would do live sex shows i was also escorting Mm -hmm. and um i was trying to build my own website too i had a contract with cherry pimps at the time Mm -hmm. so there was just a lot going on and um i just something in me just said i don't want to go to the east coast i don't want to sit on a plane for six hours i don't even want to go to the airport right now i don't want to pack i'm not about to like just go to like kentucky next weekend too you Mm -hmm. know i just like freaked out and um i like it was like i think two hours before i was supposed to get on the plane i was (laughs) supposed to already be at the airport where i had to tell my agent like i'm not going I had to pay like eight grand to get out of those feature dance contracts on good terms because they had already booked all of the flights, hotel, flyers, like marketing, like everything. Mm. Because my agency was really good about like your book, your book's solid and like we everything is confirmed and like you want to work, we've got the work for you, which I am so grateful that every agency has always done that for me. But I think all the pressure got 
cashed up to me. Yeah. I wasn't letting myself have breaks. And I was just like burnt out. And I felt like I don't want to show up to set not wanting to be there because I'm tired or resentful towards things of decisions that I've made, like not allowing myself to have breaks. Um, you're always taught to just be strong and kind of internalize things. And like I said, I was a party girl, so I don't, I didn't really have much clarity. And I think my self worth was kind of dropping a little mm-hmm. bit. So I just was like, I need a break. Mm-hmm. I just need a break. And I had only planned to take 2019 off. I wasn't mm-hmm. planning on taking five years off. Yeah. Well, yeah. Unfortunately, t- all of us took 2020 off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nobody really had a choice there. Yeah. I had only worked the first three months of 2020 Mm -hmm. and I was already out of contract. So those were like independent bookings Mm -hmm. and they were booked solid as well. Somehow I was always able to have like solid months of bookings um, and fulfilled those. And then whatever was scheduled because in, when in April was when everybody made the stance, like, no, we're shutting down. Yeah. We're in pandemic shut down. mode. Yeah. So a bunch of shit got canceled. And it was like I had started doing OnlyFans, but then I also gained 20 pounds. So mm-hmm. I was like really insecure. Mm-hmm. Um, although when people saw my my ass and my tits grew, they were like, you look great. And I was like, I feel fat. Um, and then I had that serious relationship with somebody who was taking care of me mm-hmm. financially. So I just slowed down on the OnlyFans. Like I still had the account, but I just wasn't really producing any content on there. And I did not understand the importance of responding to messages mm. with my fans and subscribers. And then social media was like, non-existent to me. I did not understand the importance of that either Mm -hmm. because I had no intentions of quitting or retiring. Um, I never announced that. I just took a break. But what was interesting was there were still uh, scenes being released of me throughout those years. I guess they were being held on. and then So no one really knew that I was on break. They just didn't see me around. But Mm -hmm. then there was still content like floating around. Yeah. Yeah. So you checked yourself into a wellness center during that time, Mm -hmm. right? What was that like? It was intensive therapy. I would go, I would have 20 hours a week of therapy and each day was different. I had like five different psychiatrists that I would talk to like every day. So one day it would be doctor whoever, next day doctor whoever. Um, We would do behavior modification training, um, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, EDMR, which is like an eye directional movement thing um, to help release traumas. We did it's yoga, like, sound one, healing. Um, where, for me, because I did that too, I held like uh, two things that like beep. It's like mm-hmm. different sounds and then mm-hmm. you have like headphones and then mm-hmm. there's like different buzzing and it's supposed to like yeah. help um, disassociate yourself from like certain mm-hmm. traumas or something mm-hmm. like that. I, that actually helped me get sober. Yeah. Some hypnosis. EMDR. Yeah, and I did get sober as well. Um, I from like from alcohol, mm-hmm. <laughs> I stopped drinking. Yeah, um, a little bit of like hypnosis, and then we had our group therapy. We had the like worksheets. Go? It was, it was, it I'm was super curious about that. I've never done it. It was interesting. It's just kind of like talking to you about something and like what you're seeing, and then you just kind of like zone out and then time passes that felt really quick and then you just wake up so it was just they actually do like lull you into some like sort of yeah do they do they really do it with like a a thingy that they wave in front of your face or it's one of those little clocks oh okay yes 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 it's the thing is just like like calm your nerves because each session that i had with a doctor would be like an hour Mm -hmm. yeah or each like um different type of therapy would be an hour and we would have group therapy like every day Mm -hmm. um so it was just it was four hours a day five days a week where? But this wasn't like a rehab, like an addiction rehab. It was just like a like a mental health wellness yeah. center. Yeah. yeah. But they were very aware that alcohol- alcoholism had um, run in my family. Yeah. Yeah. So when I did get prescribed medication, you know, there's certain medication that, um, you know, they figured out like what I would be a what is okay for me to be taking. And then I learned a lot about myself. Like I learned that I had ADHD. I always knew that I had depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And then I was just taught that all of those things are like interconnected. You know, Mm because I also had insomnia too. So it was just like flood of thoughts and, you know, just implementing like more spiritual things into my life, which I was always aware of. It's just there is some sort of like energy block there. So, you know, like meditating more, reading more, like being more um, active, which I love yoga, you know, and hiking and being more connected with nature and not feeling guilty to take time for myself you know, mm-hmm. and then it was a very humbling experience for me because I also didn't want to lose myself in the porn industry, like where like you get a big head mm-hmm. or you start to think that you're like better than people mm-hmm. or you feel like money is like the most important, you know, because I never cared about fame. Mm-hmm. I just only cared about being like successful in my career and financially stable, mm-hmm. you know, and you're making like all this money that I thought I had to have a college degree to mm-hmm. make that kind. So, and I'm living this like amazing California lifestyle that is just, I needed to just like reel myself back in, like ground myself. So we, we learn different grounding techniques too. You can do like earthing um, where you keep your feet kind of like in nature and you just kind of like pause for a minute or certain kind of touching techniques to, to ground yourself, you know, like just little different things. I still have the worksheets. I still know what the techniques are. Doesn't mean that we talked about perfection. I am not perfect in that by any means. I still have down days. I still yeah. have uncontrollable thoughts some days and actions. And uh, I have a lot of anger that I need to deal with. But it really helped me with um, my family traumas. So, like, I'm really close with my parents, and both my parents, like, don't drink alcohol anymore either. So I think by me, like, um, becoming sober in that sense, like, kind of rubbed off on them too. They're also getting older, so it was making them tired. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I just needed that. I just needed that break. It sounds like it was really beneficial to you. And like I said earlier, like, you seem, like, incredibly, like, self-aware and I imagine you probably gained a lot of that personal insight from that mm-hmm. wellness center. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've yeah. been to rehab three times and had a lot of therapy. So I'm also, I feel like I've been blessed with an abundance of yeah. self-awareness because I was so fucked up in the head. <laughs> I considered th- uh, rehab in the past, but I just like, um, they don't accept medical insurance or at least they weren't accepting mine. There was such a battle with it. Yeah, you wanted me they- to pay 20 grand a month. Yeah, to go to rehab. Yeah, I didn't get medical insurance. And um, thankfully, I had such like a good support system where I started going to meetings. The only reason I stopped going to meetings was because I was still smoking weed. Mm. I'd broken broken my elbow during that time where I got put on Mm painkillers and I can't stand painkillers. So then I just started smoking a lot of weed because of the the pain. Right. And then I just felt like I wasn't being uh, truthful to the program. Mm-hmm. But because I had, and it wasn't like it was the first time I tried to stop drinking. Yeah, like, yeah, there's yeah. There's many times where I tried to stop. Yeah. Um, you know, I've totaled three cars. I've been in a lot of minor car accidents on top of that. Have uh, destroyed a lot of relationships, have done self-harm as well. So I think if I could have like afforded to do the rehab, I would have checked myself in Mm -hmm. way early on. But that point in time in my life, like I had met people that didn't drink, which was so foreign to me um, that because I was, you know, um, hanging out and talking with them every day, like I felt like, oh, okay, like I don't need a, I don't need a drink today. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I would go to like three meetings a day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just be like, even at midnight. Just mm-hmm. on a Saturday night, just because I'm like, oh, I need to, I need like to be around people that struggle with similar, similar things mm-hmm. as me. So um, I think a lot to do with it too is thankfully I did not have a physical dependence on yeah. alcohol. I think if I did, I would have had to figure out how to go to rehab. I would have just had to pay the money. Yeah. Yeah. To do it. Yeah. Because de- detoxing from alcohol is, <sighs> is not fun. No. Is not fun. <laughs> Okay, so what brought you back into the industry? So with my my ex, um, we broke up last February, my decision. And then I decided around late July that I was going to start shooting again. I had contacted 
the current agency that I'm with now Mm -hmm. and said, hey, I'm thinking about getting in the industry. Like I know a lot of your performers, both male talent and female talent, they say good things. Um, You know, immediately wanted to sign me and I said, okay, I'll be ready to shoot in this time frame. I I didn't want to just like jump back into it. Porn is like all that I know. And like, yeah, doing OnlyFans is nice. Like you can work from home, but I just miss being part of like the adult industry community where Mm -hmm. there's people that understand what it's like to be a sex worker. And I miss being on set. Like I, I'm, I'm kind of old school. Like I enjoy being on set. (laughs) Yeah. There's a, yeah. I mean, it's like an experience, right? And you get to, it's always, it's generally, especially like depending on the company that you're working for, it's a lot of the same people, Mm -hmm. right? So Mm -hmm. they're like become people, you know, they become friends, Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. work friends and yeah, like getting your hair makeup done. If it's a makeup artist, that's good at what they do. And you know, the whole experience. Um, Yeah. Cause like shooting just cell phone stuff in your bedroom can get like lonely after a while. Yeah. Lonely and like boring. Yeah. I feel like me coming back into the, or into the industry, like shooting for companies and doing pro scenes and surrounding myself with uh, performers again is help with my creativity too. Cause mm-hmm. I feel like that was kind of getting lost yeah. with all of the iPhone shoots and like, yeah, like yeah. fans love like amateur stuff, but like, okay, where's the passion? Like, <laughs> yeah, to- it's good to have a mix. Yeah. It's good to have a mix mm-hmm. of stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, how are you taking care of your mental health now that you're back in the industry? A lot of things. <laughs> I still meditate. I still do yoga. I still um, go on like wellness retreats sometimes, uh, do sound baths. I love sound baths. Mm. Those are great. When I was having a lot of anxiety, when I was trying to get sober the last time, I went to sound baths a lot and it helped so much. Mm-hmm. I just feel like such a <sighs> relief. Yeah, like I- tunes into like the vibrations or the frequency in your body or something about it. It's really, yes. It's really great. Yes. There's also like energy healing dances that I do. There's a, the gut internal exercises that I do. Um, I also do Tai Chi sometimes, uh, if anything active, like hiking, Pilates, um, dance classes, um, reading, journaling. Um, Sound- I take medication <laughs> too. I mean, there's a lot of things that I yeah. have to do to try to like keep control. And then I have like five animals where they're like my emotional support. <laughs> and I do talk to therapists and psychiatrists and um, do different types of holistic healing. And I take self-care trips and I treat myself to spa days without guilt. Yeah. And diet. Ugh. Diet is the most challenging for me, the mm-hmm. things that I eat, because it really affects everything. I know. So, because I stress eat. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, there's such a multitude of things that I yeah. have to do. Yeah. There's even like apps that I do, like little brain exercises or like mental health check ins. There's so many different apps yeah. now. There's a technique I do called tapping which to help release energy because we store a lot of energy in our gut Mm -hmm. so it's to help to release energy block blockages i'm also really into like um like knowing about your chakras and um like the zodiac and like moon cycles and angel numbers and numerology so i pay attention to a lot of these different signs that maybe some people just think is like yeah not real, but I feel connected, more connected. To me, it's about being more connected to the universe to help what's going on inside myself, you right. know, and the t- and like the things that I listen to and like what I read. I mean, I have my fair share of vices where I like to watch junk TV. Yeah. You know, we were talking about yeah. dating shows, um, but it every day is figuring out that balance. And if I do. Um, allow my anger or sadness to get the best of me, I've learned to also have the courage to make amends with people. And they can either choose to take that and accept that or continue to keep me blocked from yeah. their life. So um, I just take ownership of every thought yeah. and decision that I yeah. do and make. Yeah. Wow. As part of the journey. <laughs> You're like, I'm very, I'm sorry. I'm very impressed by her. I don't know about the rest of you guys, but. <laughs> A lot of therapy, I, years I, of therapy. I know. I feel like you need to like 
give this all to me. I need to take therapy with you. Fuck, man. Making me feel <laughs> I'm like, shit, I need to do all that stuff too. It's a lot of work. Oh my God. All right. Well, I was going to go into <laughs> questions about your first anal scene, but I was actually more interested in, in, in everything else that we were talking about in your spiritual journey. So <laughs> we might have to save that for the Patreon questions because we have we have run out of time. So, Chloe, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. Um, can you tell everybody where they can find you online, please? Yes, you can find me on Instagram at Real Chloe Moore. That's R E A L C H L O E A M O U R. Also on X, Twitter, Real Chloe Moore. TikTok at Real Chloe Moore. And I spell it so that way you spell it right. <laughs> yeah. Because like, sometimes people will spell my name with a K or oh. they'll spell a more in Spanish instead yeah. of French. So those are my socials that you can follow me on. <laughs> Perfect. And you guys can follow me on Instagram and on X at Holly Randall. Go to hollylinks.com for access to all of my platforms. And of course, if you want to support this podcast and watch interviews like this streamed live or get access to the bonus Q&A, which we're about to do as a separate segment, um, go to patreon.com slash hollyrandallunfiltered. Thank you guys so much for joining and I will see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>